Hello, welcome to Eldridge and Company. I'm visiting with Liz Newmark today. She is a entrepreneur to the nth degree, but she's also a humanist. She's developed a business that has a heart, a conscience, and ins inspiration. Hello, Liz. How are you? Hi, Ronnie. Great to be with yeah. you, even with this, this distance. Time, I wanted really to talk today about the problem of living and having a business through these times. But I also would like you to briefly tell us about your business. Uh, my company is Great Performances, Artists as Waitresses, our, our original corporate name from 40 years ago. This is our 40th anniversary. We first met shortly after that. <laughs> That's right. As we were talking earlier, I'd like yeah. to say that you were my first celeb client. Oh, God. Um, and uh, we started as a waitress service for women in the arts because there were so few opportunities for women in the hospitality business. And by, that was 1980, by, uh, by 82, we had built our first kitchen downtown in Soho and uh, just never looked back where, uh, you know, we kept growing, kept building and special event industries really over the years has exploded in New York and catering and We've just loved every second of this crazy ride. <laughs> but you're about the largest catering business in New York, aren't you? Well, I, I you know, I always think large is not um, a great yeah, value. Right. The most delicious, most compassionate, well, I know that, most but fun. It, but I'm uh, trying to say how it, ca how it caught on. Yes, yes, because everybody thinks we're some small, you know, and that I'm like making the hors d'oeuvres and, yeah. you know, because right. I'm, I'm a girl um, <laughs> in a man's world still. Uh, no, we are probably the single largest independent catering company in New York City. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're also, in addition to catering events outside, you also cater or run the restaurants in several museums and entertainment spaces. That's right. Uh, part of our growth model was really building exclusive relationships with cultural institutions. So we do the norm at it, uh, the Brooklyn Museum, we run Dizzy's for our wonderful partners at Jazz Lincoln Center, which is that incredible jazz club uh, up at Wave Hill. And they are one of the few cultural institutions open now. We run a delicious little cafe. Um, so uh, Asia Society, we have a little cafe. So it was scattered around town. And weddings at the plaza. <laughs> <laughs> what is at the plaza but but i will say right now it's a season to have a micro wedding uh, out at caramore or wave hill yeah so yeah. i said that you were a humanist uh, entrepreneur and actually that's how i first met you because when you started your company as a wait service just providing waiters and waiters you know and waiters let's right. call them um and a bartender. Uh, you decided also to set up a scholarship or a foundation to help mm -hmm. further the careers because the people you employed were all actors of some kind or artists. And that's, that's when right. you called me. That's how I think it's because we both went to the same college and I don't know how you <laughs> got me, but anyway, you did. Oh, we Barnard girls find each other. Um, yeah, we, you know, it was just so clear that that what gave our company its extra spirit was drawing from men and women because we we did integrate and brought in the boys uh, from the arts because who knows more about the art of service than a than than a woman in the arts and the graciousness and the unflappable nature of of, of our servers. So uh, we decided, I, I remember the first year, it was two $1,000 grants. And we thought, oh my God, $2,000, that is so much money to give away. Uh, and, and we did it and we've been doing it pretty much every other year since then. And we are up to four awards of $5,000 each. Oh, that's so great. So, yeah. um, and yeah. you also um, have a farm where you grow, what? organics and it's a sustainable farm uh what's happening there you know the farm thank goodness is impervious to the pandemic uh it's a 60 acre beautiful organic farm up in kinderfoot new york which is about two hours north of the city 
and we harvested our first our first crops. I think it was in '06. So we've been we're old farmers by now, uh, and it's it's great. We grow. I like to say we grow lasagna, uh, which includes garlic and onions and kale and spinach and zucchini and peppers and um, you know all the wonderful things that I will put into my vegetable lasagna. Um, and it was a this was a really good growing year for us. Um, and the catering company was able to take everything we grew, which is wonderful. We sold a lot upstate. We have a marvelous young new farmer and his family. This is their second year. Uh, John is a native of Hudson, a Bard grad, two delicious little boys who were just joined by their new little sister, who is <laughs> was born on the farm. <laughs> she was born at home on country. So it's great. It's beautiful. Um, we connected again with the farm because my granddaughter, who was working, uh, whatever you call it, from New York, but in Ohio for the political campaign, four of them right. were, were offered a house in Kinderhook, where the farm is, uh, they're all working in different campaigns to protect the vote. And she was there for months and they used to go to the farm to have pizza and they met everybody. They were there a lot of times. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And for so many of our guests, this was the first time they'd gone out. Uh, you know, they just had been so sheltered. Mm -hmm. Either that or people drove for hours to come. <laughs> it, was uh, wonderful. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, oh, now, I'm so glad they were there. <laughs> so now that you... You're, now we have the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, most of these places are not open, or if they're open, there are very few people. Do you run, right. do you still have the restaurants at, at Jazz? And I mean, are they open? No, no, no. no. So, of all the culturals, and we're at about a dozen or so in uh, New York City, the only two that are open, Brooklyn Museum reopened, but everything we're doing there hospitality-wise comes through a very modern vending machine uh, or Wave Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've reopened the cafe there. It's all outside. And How large was your, is your average workforce when you're thriving? Pre-pandemic, uh, we were 350 full-time and about eight, 900 uh, on-call men and women on our service staff. And what are you now? Uh, I'd say full-time, we're slightly under 100. And on our hourly staff, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably under 200. How have you thrived? How have you lived through this time? Um, well, you know, I always like to think that when there's trouble, we sort of run towards it. Um, when there's need, post 9-11, we were working with the Red Cross three days after the towers fell, doing relief meals. Uh, and we were up to like 35,000 meals a day at the Family Relief Center. And then we were working for, um, you know, post Sandy, we worked for the city on rescue efforts. Uh, so late in uh, March, we connected with the mayor's office, uh, you know, they're planning all these emergency scenarios and the Department for the Aged, because all these seniors who were going to senior centers for their meals couldn't go anymore. They were, they were you know, also sheltering at home. And the city had about 80,000 new customers uh, to feed. So we jumped in, we raised our hands, we said, we can do it, we can prepare meal kits, meal boxes, and of course, we could deliver them not knowing exactly how we were gonna accomplish that. Uh, and we did, and we got started, and we were responsible for about 8,000 households, uh, mostly in Manhattan, where we delivered uh, boxes of multiple meals and our service staff, uh, there were a few men and women who raised their hand and said they would go into the field every day and hand deliver door to door these meals for the seniors. And it was, I, I, I will tell you, I think we never really quite understood what gratitude was from a customer. Mm. Oh, so I we delivered those meals. I Amazing. I can just imagine, they most likely, first of all, that they got the meals and then they ate food like they've never had before or haven't <laughs> had recently, right? <laughs> I, I like to think it was, you know, great performances boxes were the most delicious. 
Um, I mean, there were a lot of constraints just going by the nutritional standards and it was really an adjustment to look at, you know, our, our, our chefs love salt and butter. <laughs> That's the, like the secret uh, ingredient in everything we love. <laughs> so very little salt, and very little butter. No, but it was great. It was, it was but, uh, an amazing experience. But you're talking about in past tense, what happened? Uh, we continued with the program till about uh, a week or two ago. It, it's been scaled back. Uh, there are some other vendors who've been in the program and, uh, you know, should the need arise again, you know, we stand ready to, to serve. So we are continuing to evolve and we've gotten into preparing boxes. So we have customers, uh, it could be a food company, it could be uh, a consumer product that wants to send specialty meals to clients or a promotion. So we're doing hundreds and hundreds of boxes. We do have customers who are back from the workplace. I'd say about 10% of the New York City workforce is, is back in the office. One place that, that nearest and dearest to our hearts, we're, we're, we're really blessed and honored to serve everybody at Rockefeller University every day. Um, so they are back. I don't think they're quite, you know, they're, they're not 100%, but it's an amazing campus and we're keeping those brilliant minds fed. And then we have some corporate clients who, who are back. And, you know, the whole nature of food services change. You know, for, forget the buffet and the choices. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, in a, uh, it's in a box. I saw, I saw on the news something about returning to the days of Horn and Hart. <laughs> with, you, know, you know, with the putting your money in and then you open the window. But imagine you with all the resources you have and the custom and the base of clients and everything. Can you imagine what it's like to have a small restaurant someplace in a neighborhood? I, you know, the pain, the pain that, that, that we feel. Uh, and now we, we really anticipate a year of, we won't break even. And we're going to lose money every month. And, and we've prepared for this moment. And, uh, and I know we're going to make it through. Uh, because we're going to come up with other ideas, but but yes, you know, small businesses, it's it's devastating. It is absolutely devastating, and and I think that it's multi layered. And there's fear. You don't you want to protect your family. You want to protect yourself. Uh, you want to protect your business. Regulations that have been bumpy and the rollout. I, I think that the city was extremely well intentioned, but it it, it has not been a smooth sailing. Um, and then there's certain, you know, you go through Midtown, you know, I, I jaywalk at 42nd and 5th in broad daylight in the middle of the week. So uh, yeah. anybody who, who's got a business there is, is, is suffering. When you provide food, is it with the different separate agencies? So it was the Department of Aging. I don't know right. if you do anything in school, Department of Education, that kind of stuff. Or is there a central person to work with? Well, you know, uh, what the mayor did is he centralized everything under DSNY, the Department of Sanitation, and Catherine Garcia, who, of course, is, is no longer there. Yeah. And she became the food czar. So uh, everything sort of funneled through DSNY, which was very smart. I think the agencies want to reclaim their sovereignty because uh, originally we contracted with OEM, you know, Office of Emergency Management. Uh, and, and, and that was smart. And, and there were a lot of um, sort of creative uh, efforts to connect restaurants to some of the food relief. Uh, you know, we all know World Central Kitchen got enormous multi-million dollar funding from Bloomberg. And what they did was channel these like different uh, restaurants and ordered meals from them delivered them to healthcare workers and underserved communities or communities that had, you know, were experiencing extreme hunger. Uh, I don't know exactly how much longer that's going to go if the funds ran out. Everybody, I, I mean, you know, anybody who lives in a neighborhood in New York feels for our restaurants because it animates the streets and it's, it, it's delicious. It's fun. It's where life happens. Right. And, um, <laughs> So, you know, we have a program where we're feeding all these people, probably a couple of thousand, I don't know exactly, under 2,000 every day. And we, once a week, we buy all the meals from a local restaurant. 
so that we're 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 trying to share uh, mm -hmm. the opportunity. Yeah, and and you know, honestly, I know how many families, working families, depend on us. Mm -hmm. And I feel when I can't bring business in to keep our families going, I I personally feel like I've let them down, and they're my responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, but but everybody sort of feels for for restaurants because we know their faces. Um, and so we'll, we want to do our part to, to, to try to, you know, bring so business to this them. Is how, this is where your produce goes? I mean, are you overproducing? Are you selling? Uh, from the farm? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's winter, so we are okay. in, uh, in, going to acquire at a time. Um, no, you know, we're a small farm. So mm -hmm. we were lucky between the elderly. I mean, the elderly never got such fresh vegetables as they did uh, the last yeah. couple of months. And then our customers. So we are able to, to, to use everything. And, you know, we have a very robust preservation yeah. project. So we have gallons and gallons of tomato soup in the freezer. Uh, we have gallons of amazing hot sauce. We call it the uh, hot kachki. You used to have it online. I used to buy the stuff online. So where do I, can I buy any of your products anymore? Um, the <laughs> only thing we're selling retail now is the hot sauce up at Wave Hill. But Ronnie, you've got a direct uh, <laughs> connection to the growers. So I'm happy to share anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is Sylvia's Center still open? Virtually. Yeah, they did an incredible pivot. You want to tell uh, us a little bit about sure. Sylvia Center? So uh, Sylvia Center, we founded the same time we started the farm. Uh, and it started, the, the, the whole reason behind having Kachki Farm was to not only grow produce and feed our passion, but to make, create a home for the Sylvia Center, uh, whose mission is to, to really impact the lives of children through healthy eating. And we all sort of know about the obesity uh, epidemic and how our kids just are not connected to healthy food. They don't know how to cook it. They're not making it, uh, you know, with families. Uh, and so Sylvia Center teaches our kids how to cook. And we ignite palates and passion and we created a whole generation of healthy eaters. So it started at the farm. Uh, and because our lives are really in the city, we partnered uh, through the Bloomberg administration with community centers in public housing. So after school programs feature cooking programs with Sylvia Center instructions and, uh, instructors and small groups of kids. So come the pandemic, there's, there's no communal learning and everything went online. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie was amazing because we had, we had people you know, tuning in. I don't know how they heard about us in Texas, That's but great. they did. So, yeah. you know, that was the silver lining. Look, it was, it was helpful when the government was helping out with the robust mm -hmm. um, unemployment mm -hmm. benefits. But now I think everybody is, is just sort of rethinking because it, it is a long haul ahead. Yeah, it is. So you started as a photographer. You <laughs> developed this business. <laughs> You did, you had a work staff, you had a, a product that you really have supervised and made sure it's most likely the most beautiful product around. You started a farm, organic farming and all of this. I mean, how did you do that? You know, I came to the farm just from, you know, from personal tragedy um, and the Sylvia Center, but it has propelled me in a, direction that was completely unexpected yeah. and and life affirming i mean it's easy to see why i called you a humanist uh, a feminist everything um it's the collaborative effort that you have is that what also every as you said you feed off by talking to each other yeah and which is why i really hate the pandemic there's a, a political aspect to this too you know we talk about the right to education, housing, healthcare, and food is one of those rights. And to be active in New York and in commerce and to have the opportunity to, to, to bring food politics to the buffet, uh, you know, means a lot to me because as you know, we Barnard girls uh, are activists.
Mm -hmm. Did you work at all with Michelle Obama? What I really love what she did is when we started with Sylvia Center, we had to uh, convince people that there was a connection between what you ate and what you felt, how you feel. And Michelle Obama made that connection in a way that, that, that just legitimized everything that, that, you know, anybody who's cooked for children at home or anybody who knows anything about food already knew. So she was a giant. I wish it a, a business school teaching organizing of organizations or something would appoint, have you as an adjunct professor because you have brought to a, to its height of success, the whole idea of collaborative working, of a conscience of working, you know, of, of, of a dream about what the world should be like. You know, Ronnie, maybe that's the female, if I can say, uh, approach. So if we had uh, more women in, in power, uh, you know, just general solutions would be, um, would be better. We'd you see think a, a different temperament. It's a, you think it's a more personal, heartfelt kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think, you know, women should rule the world, uh, right? Yes. Uh, less war, you know, more compassion, more collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's not every, mm -hmm. you know, every gal who's going to feel that way. But um, mm -hmm. sorry. So you've got an incredible also uh, website. It's mm -hmm. greatperformances.com. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we just did a whole lot of work on it today because we're trying to think, you know, you go to the website, you're thinking COVID, you're not thinking COVID. People are planning for the future. We should plan for the future. Uh, our, our businesses will survive. Uh, people will gather around the table. You know, there will come a time when you'll be willing to be in a room with 300 strangers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not immediately, but I, but I, you know, I, I have to believe that's, that is going to come back. So, right. so we try to juggle all these different realities on the website. So. And you also have recipes. <laughs> and yes, a lot of recipes. And lessons and everything else. Anyway, everybody should go look at this website. Uh, Liz, I don't know exactly what I could do, but I'd like to give you a big award or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope. A hug. <laughs> I hope that. <laughs> Uh, all these young women who are activists and are interested follow your path. Thank so we've, you. We've come to the end, and I thank you again. Uh, it's so good to see you, Ronnie. And I'm going to look for you on the west side. You like hot sauce? Do I like hot dogs? Hot yeah. sauce. Yeah, yeah. I like yes, everything. I, I make an incredible fermented hot sauce. Oh, you know, hot and, sauce. And, and oh, I know. I sauce. had some of that. It was wonderful. I'll, I'll get you some. You too. Thank you.